Rack and roll, shadows of Centris. So we're being stalked, Koa notes as all three of them weave their way through the crowds. Amadi bends his vision with Axiom to see behind them. A Muffus with pale blue skin and pearly wool is staring at them and following closely. The Muffies? She's been following us for about two city blocks, Koa says calmly. She's packing some kind of weapon under her armpits in some kind of holster. Still a little early, she could just be heading the same way, Reggie remarks as he looks at the windows of parked cars to see her in the reflections. Easy way to find out. Follow my lead, Koa says before openly looking at a nearby street sign and then holding his arms out to stop both Reggie and Amadi. He points up at the sign and then does a visible sigh and turns around. Come on, guys. Now they're heading right for the Muffies, who seems to panic and jitters to the side. They walk past her and she starts following again. Lead her into an alley. Time to see what she knows, Amadi says with Axiom sending his words to their ears and their ears only. Control, we've got a follower. Muffis, young appearing, likely armed. Reggie texts back to the Dauntless. Confirmed. Confront her if she can be isolated. If not, keep moving and a team will be there shortly in case assistance is needed. Control sends back and Reggie shows his text to Koa and Amadi. Their previously directionless wanderings take them further into the spire and down a main street before they go into increasingly isolated areas. The Muffies is not only following but talking to someone as she digs out her own communicator fairly often and the sensation of something being up starts creeping over the three. Control. Instincts say something's wrong. How close is backup? Reggie sends and it's a few moments for a response. ETA five minutes. Still suiting up. Control replies and Reggie grimaces. Helps a bit of a way away. If this goes south, then we're on our own for a little bit. Shit. Well, no point whining and bitching, Amadi notes. We're using the alley. They take a left turn and Amadi works his literal magic. However, the Muffy stops at the entrance, clearly sensing the illusion even if she can't see past it. She's one of the types that relies more on axiom senses, it seems. Not that it helps her much as Koa reaches through the illusion and the only glimpse she sees of him is a brown-skinned hand grabbing her by the shoulder and pulling her into the empty alley. I knew it, she exclaims as she hits the wall. That was not a proper reaction to being snatched and held up against a wall by a living slab of Hawaiian muscle. Knew what? Koa asks. You're working against us. Well, sorry to say little human, but we're ready. She snarls at them. She then throws her head back and lets out a bleeding bay, yeah, like a damn war cry. One that's returned through dozens of mouths and lasers and plasma both crash through Amadi's illusion. Control, we're about to be stampeded by fucking sheep with ray guns. I'm not sure if I need a reality check or a border collie to deal with this. Reggie sends into his communicator as all three of them get into cover. Koa drags the Muffies with him by the throat and pins her to the ground. Amadi abandons subtly in his illusions to kill any attempt at aiming with their baying opposition. They respond with a huge amount of fire, making good use of literally endless ammunition and a clear amount of enthusiasm. Who are you people? Koa demands the Muffies, even as he takes away her weapon. In row laser pistol. Looks like she used string to fix it at one point as the grip is completely wrapped. Harder daddy! She chokes out and he snarls in disgust. He obliges and her grasping at his arm goes from frantic to caressing. He's forced to dodge to the side as a plasma bolt eats through his cover like a hot knife through butter and some hair melts as he barely dodges. She starts to scramble away and he grabs her by the foot and puts her into a headlock before going deeper into cover. Let's start again. Koa begins as he keeps her pinned. She pulls at the axiom, but so can he and he's stronger by several factors both with and without axiom. Who are you? Why were you following us and what makes you think that this will not have enormous consequences? 
You know who we are. You know why. We are the consequences. She protests as she tries to go for the laser pistol he confiscated, and a bit more wrestling has it tossed to Reggie who catches the weapon. Amadi, make our cover one way. I want to be able to actually aim. Reggie orders and Amadi nods. Amadi slinks further to the ground and takes a meditative position. The illusion wavers and there's only a mild haze effect that lets all three men in the Muffies see the small army of sheep women arrayed. An all Muffis gang. Would a lamb chop joke be appropriate? Reggie asks, leaning out a little and taking careful aim. One of the Muffis gets a bit of a shearing and the girls scatter a little, but quickly come back to restore their firing lines. The ones at the very front are lying down. Behind them are kneelers and standing Muffies behind them. These girls are organized. They have a plan and they know what they're doing. This is well beyond some simple gang and... Reggie, the other way, Koa shouts and Reggie turns his head to see that these Muffies are organized enough to work in squads. There's a moment as Amadi grunts in annoyance and the illusions break as there's a massive wrenching sensation in the axiom. Suddenly all four of them, captured Muffis included, are on the patios up a level or two and Amadi stands up even as Koa puts his hand over the mouth of the Muffis. They watch as the two-pronged herd of ray gun wielding sheep women close in on their former hiding places and then break into a searching pattern. It doesn't take long for one of them to look up and the bombardment of lasers and plasma to begin again. Thankfully, they have more distance now so the lasers and plasma are dissipated enough that the patio provides better cover. All right, we need a plan. I've got a grenade. Reggie is cut off when his communicator goes off. He checks it. Asterisk armed Muffis gang. Are you what they're shooting at? Is the text. Reggie sends a asterisk Y asterisk as his response. Asterisk confirmed. Engaging. Is the only response. Bombs! One of the Muffies screams from below. The three men shelter away from the edges of the patio and the distinct bangs, flashes, and a hissing sound tells them that flash bangs and smoke just slam the alley below. Before they can fully rise, the alleyway rings out with the sounds of brutal impacts and baing screams of pain and fright. By the time they stand up, they can faintly make out the silhouettes of figures. One is falling down away from one of the two standing figures and hits the ground with a smack. One of them pulls up his arm and taps at it. All three of their communicators go off with his message. Hostiles neutralized. Bring us down Amadi, Koa says, and Amadi nods. Moments later, all three of them are at the edges of the smoke. Reggie and Amadi offer salutes to the soldier they can barely make out through the cover of the grenade, and Koa nods while keeping his prisoner pinned. Is that their initial scout? The soldier asks. There is no trace of ethnicity or accent in his voice. The man could be of any race with his combat mask up and imposing but not overwhelming size. Whoever this is, they're well-trained, very skilled, and not to be fucked with. On his collar is a single alpha symbol. It is. It was her scream that signaled the others to attack. Koa answers. Oddly organized for a gang, the soldier notes. Full on firing lines with girls on the ground, girls kneeling and girls standing to fire over each other. Reggie confirms. Surprisingly good. The firing line was a suppressing distraction to keep us pinned in distraction as the second team came around the back to give the killing blow. This isn't some idiot gang. This was organized and trained, militia level at least. Amadi remarks. The other soldier walks up. He's identical to the first. The only difference is the Omega symbol on his collar. Moderately to well-maintained equipment. NRO Industries manufacture. Moderate body armor over vital organs with ceramics. No specific identifying marks or numbers on either members or equipment. Likely a covert operation. How? The Muffy's Koa still got captured asks in a shocked tone. It, was there just two of you? 
Meet Alpha and Omega. The undaunted are the best of the best. These are those who are better still, Koa says slowly. What I am to an untrained civilian, these men are to me. So smile, little girl. You're among monsters. There have been multiple attacks on wanderers. Gangs are suddenly extremely hostile. Most rapid response groups are already dispatched. We need to sit on these girls until we have a wagon to drag them in, Omega states. That, why didn't we get a warning? You started broadcasting danger signs just before a warning could be sent out to you. Preparations to reinforce you were being made at that point. The rest of the wanderers are being withdrawn for the day. Oliphas, Reggie asks, perhaps dozens of unconnected gangs have suddenly turned extremely hostile. These women were some of the better organized. But a sudden upswing in violence? The timing is extremely suspicious. Omega confirms. Shit, I think she's going to have a visit soon, Reggie says. It's underway, Omega states. What? Amadi asks. Amala Olifas is a hard woman to please on a normal day, but after a series of whispers had gone so perfectly, how could it be anything but a pleasing day? Those stupid little humans thought themselves so clever. Unfortunately, their little trawling effort for the stupid little play conspiracies and clubs of centrists left a good number of them very vulnerable to things such as random angry women. Everything about the race is small. Small-bodied women, small-minded men, and so very, very small in number. Who cares if they're apex or some kind of anomaly in the galaxy at large? When you're outnumbered so badly that your entire species can be lost in a rounding error, you just don't matter. No matter how many friends or favors you may have, a grain of sand in an ocean cannot change the tides, nor can it so much as inconvenience the fish within it. Pardon me, madam, the waiter says, and she sighs. It had been a good day, but now something was about to get in the way. Wonderful. Ordinarily, the Nagasha man as head waiter was a lovely sight, but at the moment she loathed him for spoiling her good mood. Something has gone wrong at this overpriced and overpraised establishment. Unfortunately, due to a computer error your reservation was mixed about. To compensate, we've arranged for you to enjoy our more lavish private dining experience with your bill for the day paid by the party responsible. I am terribly sorry for this, the waiter says, and she smiles. Mistakes aside, they know how to make up for it. Thank you very much for both your honesty and integrity. I'm glad to know you understand how valuable my time is, she says, and he bows to her and then leads her to a nearby chamber. He turns the lights on, and there's a sense as if she had entered a treasure vault for her dining experience. The lights of the chamber are movement activated, and the room glows as if she were dining in a void. There are several races and numerous fashion styles this appeals to in a dozen different ways. Entropic art, it's called. The beauty of nothingness. A picture of this chamber could be placed on some poor rube's wall and it would work as a centerpiece. I will return shortly with our drink and appetizer menus unless you have a preference you would like to start with, the waiter asks. The menus, please, she says, and he nods before pulling out a chair for her. Of course, madam. Excuse me, the head waiter says before slithering out. The doors automatically close behind him. Alone but undoubtedly watched over the hidden cameras, Amala relaxes ever so slightly. Today had gone ever so perfectly. A simple text system on a communicator registered to a false name, and she had an army of her own. Militaries are so stupid. Why bother training and housing all those boorish soldiers when you can simply whisper the right words to the right ears, or rather text the right people, and have the armies rise up themselves? She giggles to herself before smiling and clapping her hands to activate all the lights in the room. Only half of them come on. That's irritating. Lights. The lights will turn on when I decide and your menu will only arrive after we have spoken, a clipped voice says in noble Galenix. 
the oldest language of her home world. Her grandmother still speaks with a distinct Galenix accent. Who are you? She demands. Her grasp of the traditional language is halting compared to the stranger's. She has a guess as to who this is, but to learn the language of her grandmother. So quickly, she had only been interacting with this group for three days. I am upset with you. However, I am not unreasonable or unreasoning. The voice continues and there's a snapping noise. The lights turn on to show Admiral Cistern with his hand up as he had just snapped his fingers. Resting against the table is the ceremonial sword of office he's always seen with. He reaches into his uniform coat and pulls out a weapon, which he then lays on the table. We need to speak. Oh, this should be interesting, she mutters. To quote a mildly popular movie, you had my curiosity, now you have my attention. Admiral Cistern says, now in galactic trade, no accent. Did you think that sending your goons to follow me about was funny? She asks him. Did you think that leading A would be killer to one of my men was amusing? He returns in an unflappable tone. I simply went to a dress fitting, she remarks airily. I simply altered the pattern of normal patrols to keep my men from getting sloppy. He returns with ease. What do you want? She asks as dancing around isn't going to get her anywhere with this one. I want this idiot rivalry to stop. We've both made the point that we can play the silly dance around game with enough plausible deniability to give nearly anyone in the legal profession the bends. You lured a crazed gunwoman to my man. I had you watched for a day. You set gangs on my men and now I speak with you. If this escalates further, you would be wise as to remember which of us leads the military organization and which one leads a trade conglomeration. So, shall we put this unpleasantness behind us? I don't make deals with small people with less power. You are not my equal. And if you won't be my servant, then I will have nothing to do with you but what I will and please, she states. Is that your final answer? Admiral Cistern asks with a dangerous lilt in his tone. You cannot do a thing to me. You have no legal grounds to touch me. Madam, you grossly, severely underestimate me. Enjoy yourself, madam, Admiral Cistern says, and he pointedly looks away. A gnarled hand falls on Amala's shoulder. Hello, little girl, Madame Stepanova whispers into her ear. A minute later, the head waiter arrives with the drink and appetizer menu. He says nothing as he puts them in front of Admiral Cistern, the only other person in the room. Thank you, young man, he says with a smile before browsing the selection. 